that you would grant to us keen insight into the text of your scripture. And I pray that you would help us to orientate the promise given in its proper chronological perspective, but to enjoy it every day we live. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. But tonight I invite you to open your Bible to 1 John chapter 3. And you say, uh, uh, now I'm not sure anybody would ever say this. Somebody said, asked me once, do you remember what you preached last Sunday morning? And I couldn't. It's amazing sometimes. Um, but you may think, this sounds familiar. And it does so because I preached from this text last Wednesday night. And if you remember, I said, I'm going to come back next Wednesday night. <laughs> and when this week started, I said to Jenna, what text was I going to come back to this Wednesday night? She said, I can't remember either. So I had to look on my computer and I, I found it. So thanks be to God. I'm getting old enough that, um, well, we'll leave that. Uh, just as as it is this was the text that i preached from last week on the subject of the powerful love of god the love of god and its transformational power um and you'll see that but tonight i want to deal with a different concept the title of tonight's sermon is today's hope tomorrow's promise first john chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 i'll be reading from the esv See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Oh, beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Last week, we thought about the love of God expressed in making us his children. And how wonderful it is that right now we are the children of God. And, and we looked at why that was so encouraging and and comforting but tonight i want to look at the other big theme and that is the future now i have a thing or two that i need to say about about that nothing gets christians so convoluted as to contemplate the future and nothing gets christians more discombobulated than eschatology i don't think i have heard more arguments in the church than over eschatology and the church would be better off if we'd all quit doing that huh. pastor how do you really feel about that huh? we really don't know as much as we think we know but we do know this Jesus Christ is coming back. And we know that when he comes back, he will, in his coming, finish the job that still needs to be done. We know that. No question about it. And we should not try to fill in the gaps with our theoretical considerations where God chose not to fill in the gaps. There's enough to rejoice over in knowing Christ is coming back. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the future. I want to talk to you about his second coming under the heading of today's hope, tomorrow's promise. And I'm going to do so under two large headings. First, today's limitation, strengthened by tomorrow's hope. Today's limitation, strengthened by tomorrow's promise and hope. And second, today's hope, based on tomorrow's promise today's hope based on tomorrow's promise 
I want to look, if you would, please, at <clears throat> verse 2 of our text and see what God's Word says about our human limitation, today's limitation. Beloved, we are God's children now. Again, he's emphasizing that there's a now part of the promises of the gospel. And the now is that when you come to faith in Christ, you become a child of God right then. You don't have to wait to receive eternal life when you die. You have eternal life in that moment of your regeneration. You're a child of God. And then he says the following, verse 2, what we will be has not yet appeared. Notice the interplay between now and will be. I said this last Wednesday, I'll say it again. One of the most important things we need to learn in biblical interpretation is what part of the scripture relates to the now and what part of the scripture and the promise of the gospel relates to the future that we do not yet have. Verse 2 says, we do not now have the knowledge of what we will be when he appears. There are three things the scripture says that we don't have, that we're limited in. At least three. One is knowledge. We're limited in knowledge. And it's a good thing for a Christian and indeed a pastor to acknowledge that he or she is limited in knowledge. One of well, the problem that got Eve in trouble and got the rest of us messed up was she wanted to know what God said she shouldn't know. I want to know what it's like to re eat of that fruit over there. God said, look, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, but that tree, no. Now, isn't it just like people to want to do what they're told not to do? You tell a child, don't do this, and what do they do? I see some of you grinning. You, you, you remember something. Your children, the minute you said don't, they wanted to do it. There's something in us like that. We don't have knowledge. And when God says you, you shouldn't have knowledge, we ought not to have that knowledge. Leave it with God. I love Deuteronomy 29, 29. Do you like that? In fact, it's so sweet. Let me read it to you because this is one of those. Do you underline verses in your Bible? If you do, underline this one. If you don't, underline it in your mind. 29, 29. This, brothers and sisters, will preach. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Look. There are some things you ought not to know. They're the secret things of God. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If God doesn't say you ought to know it, don't worry about knowing it. You don't need to know it. But he revealed certain things. And by the way, I think I'm going to use this verse in my talk next week at the conference. The things that he's revealed are the things that he's clearly made, made plain in the scripture. It's called perspicuity of scripture. Those are the things we better find out because God has made them plain in the Bible, right? But what if he didn't make it plain? Well, we'll just read the latest book from Life's, Lifeway and we'll figure it out, right? No, if God didn't make it plain, just write it down. You are not going to know what God didn't tell you you could know. You're limited in knowledge. That's okay. You're also limited in capability. You can't do anything you want to do. I always loved when I run into a free willer. You know what a free willer is? Oh, I'm free in my will. I have free will. I said, really? That's great. You're free. Yeah, I'm free. I said, then choose to be perfect this week. You have free will. Exercise your will to be perfect. Well, I can't do that. Oh, you just told me you had free will. Some of you don't like that, do you? Well, bless your pea picking heart. What you need to understand is you're limited in capability and you can't choose your way out of that. And, you know, I think that's a good thing to admit. I just can't do certain things. God knows I can't do certain things. 
And I need to acknowledge that. We're also limited in experience. Now I'm going to talk to my charismatic friends, none of whom are here tonight. Do you know there are some experiences God does not want you to have right now? Oh, experiences are always good. Really? The Bible says, be innocent and evil and wise and good. No, you're, you and I are limited in knowledge and capability and experience. And I would advise each one of us to live within the confines of our limitation and do it with contentment and joy. Relax, don't sweat it. Focus on what God has said in his word. This text says to us, we do not know what we shall be. Verse 2. And you can't fast and pray and figure it out. Or get several Bible degrees and figure it out. You are not. You don't know what you're going to be. That's today's limitation. But let me add to that a second. And that is today's hope. Even though we have limitation today, we also have hope today. What is today's hope? Today's hope is based on tomorrow's promise. What is tomorrow's promise? There are two aspects to it in the text. First, the text says, verse 2, we know that when he appears, now who's he? Jesus. He's his second coming. And the word appears is one of the New Testament Greek words for the second coming. When he appears, when he shows up again, we shall be like him. Now, I want you to think with me about that. This is a promise superb. When he appears, you, brothers and sisters, and I will be like him. Does that get anybody excited? Does anybody want to be like Jesus? Would that, would that be an improvement? <laughs> Romans 8.29 says, God predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of redemption is for Christ to be the firstborn of many brethren, the Scripture says. Salvation is, is, is crafting us, forming us to be like Jesus. And that's what sanctification is. It's growth in Christ's likeness, right? All right. The Bible says there's a promise in the gospel that when Jesus comes, we will be like him. Now, let me clarify. You will never be Jesus. All right. This isn't saying you're going to be Jesus. It says you're going to be like Jesus. Let me suggest some ways we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to be like Jesus in our hearts. In the deepest part of our souls, we will be righteous and godly. We know that even now in this world, we fight temptation. And sometimes it's with the world and sometimes it's with the devil. But sometimes it's with our flesh. It's with me. My worst enemy is me. If I could do something about me, I can't, you know, someone said, I'm going to get away from temptation. I'm going to go live in a cave. But yeah, but you go with you. That's the problem. You can't get away from you. But in that day, when God finishes what he began in you, and Philippians 1, 6 says, he will finish what he began in you in Christ Jesus. You will be totally, absolutely in the very fabric of the essence of your humanity, like Jesus Christ. That's good news. You'll be like him in your mind. You will think like Christ. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God the Father wants me to think like Jesus. And I don't. <laughs> but I want to. And I will. I'll be like him in my mind. I will even be like him in my body, in my, in my heart, in my mind, even in my body. How will we be like him in body? 
because we'll have a resurrected body. When he comes again, our bodies, if you've died before Jesus comes, your body's going to come out of the grave. It's going to be reconstituted. And the scripture says those who are alive, they're going to be Christians on earth when Jesus comes. And those Christians who are here will be instantaneously transformed, metamorphosized, if you will, to be just like Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, we will not all sleep. That is, we will not all die, but we shall all be changed. That's good news. I want a new body. You want a new, anybody want a new body? The body of the resurrection. And Philippians 3 says, our bodies in the resurrection will be fashioned after his body. I won't be Jesus, but my body will be like his body. It will be like him. Romans 8, I'm going to read this verse to you. And if you'd like, you can turn to Romans 8. <clears throat> there are so many verses of Romans 8, as you very well know, and I love them all. But I want to reflect on verse 19. Just to connect the dots here just a bit. Um, Paul is saying creation is groaning. By the way, creation was groaning up on this hill this afternoon. Man, the rain was horizontal. And I looked at those trees, and man, they were, creation was groaning. Creation's been groaning in Turkey lately with earthquakes. Creation is groaning. Verse 18, let me, let me start. For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed in us or to us. Verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing. For the revealing of the sons of God. Wait a minute. That sounds futuristic. I thought 1 John 3 says we are now the sons of God. We are. Well, what is this waiting for the revealing of the sons of God? This has to do with the end result of the process. When God reveals in us in every aspect of our being. That we are the children of God. Even our bodies will reflect that. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly. But because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. And obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There it is. This revealing of the Son of God. Will reveal us as the children of God. In all aspects. Of our being. Back to my text. What's tomorrow's promise? First. It is that when Jesus comes. We will be like him. Second. Tomorrow's promise also includes something else. Verse 2. At the end of verse 2 of chapter 3 of 1 John. <clears throat> we shall be like him. Because. Now he's connecting. What he's about to say with what he has just said. Because we shall see him. As he is. He just said we will be like him. Now we will see him. What does that mean? It means that we will be with him. We will be exposed. To his glory. And we will be relationally connected to him in such a fashion that our union in Christ will be complete in that great eternal day. If you will turn with me again to John's Gospel, chapter 17. I always read from the Gospel of John these days with some hesitancy because I want to preach through John. But in John 17, Jesus' prayer to the Father, he says this, Father, verse 24, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, 
Remember John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Here he says, I, I want them to be with me. And then notice verse 24. To see my glory. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ prayed a prayer that the Father will answer. That 1 John 3, 2 says, we will see him as he is. Without depravity. Without degradation. Without distance. Without a diminished relationship. We will be with him. And we will see him just as he is. We will see him with joy. Oh, the joy to see Jesus and to be accepted by him and to be embraced by him. Oh, the love. Oh, no love is like the love of our Lord that we will share together. Heaven is a place for lovers. The acceptance we feel, the worship, the wonder, So this is tomorrow's promise. We'll be like him. And we will see him as he is. We don't know yet everything that goes along with that. We're limited. But our hope is based on those two aspects of his promise. When will that happen? Well, verse 2. When he appears. Well, Pastor, when when will it will that be next Wednesday? I don't know. Why do you want to know that? Just live for Jesus and wait. We're told to wait. Titus 2:13. Wait. Waiting for that blessed hope. The coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wait. Jesus is coming back. I say again with certainty: Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he comes back. All will be changed. And we will be changed. And our joy will be complete. Is that worth looking forward to? How, how does that help me now? It helps me now because I know every day I live, I'm one day closer. And that if God made me a promise, he's going to keep that promise. And no matter how stupid I am, no comments, please. God's going to get me there. God's going to get me there. And it won't be long. The older I get, the sooner it seems. It won't be long. Today's hope, tomorrow's promise. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, grant mercy. That when we are tempted and tried and strained. When we are pushed. To the end of our tether. When we're. Attacked. Criticized. Verbally abused. Abandoned. That we will once again find ourselves grounded in the fertile soil of faith, believing in and embracing the hope that is ours in Christ, which is superior to any and every experience. Thank you for the promise, Jesus. Thank you for the promise, Heavenly Father. We embrace it as life itself. Make it our security blanket. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.